Well, confidence in the United States Supreme Court has hit an all-time low, according to research from Gallup, with just 25 percent of Americans saying they have confidence in the Supreme Court, down from 36 percent in 2021. I don't think this is much of a surprise, um, although I would say, you know, what's interesting about this is obviously I think right now a lot of the country is very pleased with the Supreme Court with their recent rulings with the Second Amendment and with Roe v. Wade. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I, yeah. right. Is, is the poll skewed, you know, or is it that most people just really do not support these things? Well, it's an interesting question, right? Because the, the decline suggests that some people even on the right are less satisfied with the Supreme Court, which would be aligned with the reality that most conservatives wanted to uphold Roe. I mean, a majority of Americans rather wanted to uphold Roe. And that you're seeing now when people are asked about their feelings with the case, you're getting some commentators who are saying things like, well, you can still get abortion in the first few weeks, demonstrating a, a complete misunderstanding of what this mm -hmm. case actually decided. I think a lot of people thought it was about something like a 14-week abortion ban, which was, to be clear, initially the law in Mississippi that you know motivated all of this, that they gave, right. bore, bore this fruit. But there was an overreach um, by people who were advocating for this court to take up the bigger issue. They've done that, and I think that's disturbed even some conservatives. Additionally, with respect to the, the, gun, the, the gun ruling, even that, it involved a New York state gun legislation that didn't necessarily have, it wasn't something that people were like chomp, champing at the bit for across the country or in Red America. And it's not mm -hmm. clear to me that even the, the, the positive tenor of that would counterbalance the negative tenor of the Dobbs ruling if conservatives weren't already kind of hot for that outcome. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The the, the recent ruling with, with the Roe v. Wade ruling is interesting in that you're right. The actual case itself was challenging a 15 week ban, I, I believe. Right. Was it that 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 yeah, was what they was were forced. asking mm -hmm. for? Yeah. And they instead the court went over and beyond. And even though Roberts was like, we, I don't think we need to go above and beyond this and reverse the entire thing. You know, we can maybe put a just limit it at that 15 week mark. But instead, the courts completely. And so now you've got states with their trigger laws and states saying that they're going to completely outright ban it. And that is not, I think, the majority viewpoint, even for people who wanted to ban it in the second or third trimester. They felt like that first, you know, so I, I yeah, maybe that is why there are people that say, you know, OK, yeah, I wanted this. I wanted the limitation. I didn't want these later term abortions or these second term abortions, but they've really kind of gone above and beyond. But I think the big question is, what do people want to do to fix it? I know there's a lot of conversation about expanding the court. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly or, or term limits for the justices. You know, what are some of the solutions you're hearing? I mean, those, those are they. I, I think AOC has really been talking a lot about uh, packing the court. I think that she's right to do so. I think in a moment where there's this much frankly, bipartisan frustration with the court. Let's not forget there was a case a couple of weeks a weeks ago where the Supreme Court said that you basically don't have Fourth Amendment rights within 100 miles of the U.S. border, which is where the overwhelming majority of Americans live. It's basically the entire state of Florida, the entire state of Michigan, uh, right? Because uh, border control agents, you have no legal recourse to sue them if they unlawfully enter your home, uh, break your mm -hmm. belongings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of conservatives, rightly, were concerned Concerned about that holding, where we are anticipating a holding uh, that implicates the EPA's ability to regulate uh, the environment, which is a pretty core function. I think a lot of people, and frankly, a bipartisan basis, are going to be concerned with. I was recently talking to someone about uh, who lives in West Virginia about their frustrations with uh, the trade-off they're constantly presented with between jobs and being very proud of their tourism industry and the, and the nature that is in West Virginia and being told that they have to put up with all of these polluters that are literally making their communities and their children sick. So, you know, what to do about that when FDR? The most popular president in American history was passing his slate of legislation that, again, were overwhelmingly popular in, in the wake of, um, you know, uh, economic turmoil. The Supreme Court stood in his way, and he didn't ultimately have to pack the Supreme Court. The threat was enough for them to start ruling in his favor. And I think the Democrats should take that lesson well. However, I think that they are more concerned with a potential backlash from Re Republicans than the possibility that they might actually deliver for their party, even if it's just rhetorical and making, and even if it's just that they look like they care. And that's creating yeah. this gap, this confidence gap, where it's like, 
You're saying that abortion rights are the be-all, end-all. You're saying that this is a, a human right. You're saying that the Republicans are so terrible and they've played so dirty and they've gotten justices they shouldn't have gotten and all of this kind of thing, but you're not willing to do a single action in kind that was commensurate with what you say you're being presented with. And so it makes the yeah. Democratic Party seem really empty. Well, I just really wish that this would be a wake up call to legislators to actually do their jobs. You know, there is so much legislation going on by the at the bench and it really shouldn't be. I mean, the Supreme Court should just be deciding the courts should just be deciding whether or not certain laws are constitutional or not constitutional. Um, and really, the laws themselves need to be made by our legislators. And they don't. They, they kick everything to the courts. And now I think what we're seeing with these court decisions I my, the, the Second Amendment one was a bit different, but most of them that we're seeing is that they just say, leave it up to the states, leave it up to the states. You guys or, are just going to have to go back and actually make laws. Or in the alternative, I mean, the, the gun case was a New York state law that the Supreme Court invalidated. Right. I mean, you can, because it was it, in that it, Constitution. you can say it was unconstitutional, but here's the bigger problem right. that a lot of people are pointing to. The idea of constitutional interpretation has always been... I'm sorry, it's been empty, it's been absurd, it's never been a real thing. There are, as I talked about in my radar, enumerated rights the Constitution protects, but they are limited in number. And in the Ninth Amendment, they make it clear that these are not all of the rights that the Constitution protects. Because there's all of this leeway, because now hundreds of years have passed and all of these conditions have arisen that the founders could never have anticipated, the, the, the justices are basically there to cherry pick what they think should be a federally protected right and what they don't think is a federally protected right. And the idea behind originalism, which is that you just make decisions based on going back and reading the plain text of the document and also the history right. at the same time is bunk. One, because as you saw in the Second Amendment decision, they went back and read, uh, sorry, in the Dobbs decision, they went back and read history from like the 13th century, which has nothing to do with anything and isn't even part of the rules of constitutional interpretation. And moreover, the historical readings that they do do about, let's say, the Second Amendment ignore the plain wording and that was common at the time of a well-regulated militia, which in no way was intended to mean the expansive access to machine guns and the like that we have today. They had not even normal bullets invented at that time. They had musket shot that you had to slow load from the front. And so it goes both ways. It's just not, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have Second Amendment rights, but I think Second Amendment people, people for whom that's a real priority, need to recognize that they have an activist judge giving them those rights the same way they think that there's an activist judge giving right. women the right to choose. All of it yeah, is made I, up. I completely agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I, I don't, I, I agree that I don't think there is really such a thing as a sort of originalist idea of interpreting the, you know, the, the Constitution based on how it actually is written. Nobody's really doing that on either side, whether they're uh, conservative or liberal. They're interpreting it the way that they want to interpret it. And that is fine. We just need to admit that, I think, on both sides, that it is sort of activism happening at the bench on both sides of the aisle, for sure. Um, I agree with you on that completely. I think then the question now is, again, what do we do about this? So I'm not the biggest fan of the idea of packing the court. I know you mentioned FDR. You know, his, his, his idea was... I think it was um, he would want to replace. He wanted Congress to pass a law to allow him to replace justices that hit 70 years old. So basically, a aging them out, and that they decide they ultimately didn't do it because they thought ah, that gives you a lot of power. There's a lot of old judges. Um, the last time that this actually fluctuated, I mean, we've had nine justices for many since 19 uh, 1866. I think is the last time we mm -hmm. actually made changes to the number of justices on the bench, and that uh, maybe a little bit after that. But yeah, I'm um, not sure the date. Uh, it was around. It was right after the Civil War. It was Andrew Jackson. They didn't like him. They wanted the Congress thought he had too much power. They didn't like, so they whittled down from ten to seven justices because they didn't want him to be able to appoint a justice. And then at some point it went back to nine. So I'm not really sure what the date was and when it went back to nine. But you know that was so. What what concerns me about that was the last time we really made these changes was coming out of a civil war, and I'm feeling the heat now. I'm feeling like we're kind of at that point in history where we're we're so contentious towards one another that I worry, you know, that we're headed towards something like a civil war. And so if we start doing things like changing the makeup of the court like we did during the civil war era, I mean it just kind of to me is like one more indicator that we're in that we're in that contentious I, of a time period. I, I think that's right. And another point that I made in my radar was that, you know, the Dred Scott case in many ways precipitated the Civil War, because it highlighted the extent to which a 
free, a, a state in which they decided slaves were free had to be beholden. If someone living in that state did not have rights, they were beholden to the rights of the, the, the slave state that they had left, right? And the outcome in that case, the Supreme Court saying that slavery was constitutional, really lit the fire under the abolitionist movement and said, the, 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 this shall not stand. And when Mayor Abraham Lincoln uh, issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he claimed constitutional authority, but of course there was nothing in the written text of the Constitution that actually gave him that authority. So we're seeing at the same time the feeling that people need power and authority from the Constitution to make moral claims, at the same time that there right. never has been in the text of the Constitution for the overwhelming majority of people in this country, real, a real constitutional basis for them to be protected. And, right. and, so, and then of course we had a civil war, to your point. So my issue is this. We spend a lot of time talking about statutory interpretation, or originalism, um, these, the, the structural reality of is this person making the argument in the right way or that or the wrong way. And I think at times it can obscure the moral argument and obscure the moral argument for people who are making an immoral argument and also have people that are wanting to make a moral argument feeling like they have to couch it in ridiculous terms to pretend that Thomas Jefferson, who was out here like, you know, raping his slaves and selling his children into slavery, would technically agree with them, right? You should be able to just make the case. If you think that you should have gun rights because you live in an unsafe place you need to hunt because you need to defend your family. Just make the case. Right. If you feel like yeah. you should have abortion rights because it is it, it, it's necessary for your autonomy as a woman and you want to be able to make decisions with your doctor, just make, make the case. The case. Yeah. But people are hiding behind the Constitution in both ways. Yeah, it is. It is. It's kind of. Odd. I've always thought it was really odd that there's this sort of like deitizing of the original of the founding fathers, almost like well they knew all and they wrote right. this document, and now we're like these, you know, the little minions that have to follow what these gods wrote because gods knew better than us, and they they weren't. They were just men writing based on what they knew at their time. So I completely agree with you. If you want something, we should be making the case. And that should be done, you know, point by point rather than going back and saying, well, but the gods said and they wrote this document. And by the way, I have to correct myself. It wasn't Andrew Jackson. I always get them confused. Johnson. It was mm. Andrew Johnson. He was the vice president for Abraham Lincoln that then seceded him after he was assassinated. And I always get them confused. But he was the one that they didn't like. They didn't want him to have any power. So they whittled down the court. They cut it down. Um, to, from 10 to 7, and then at some point it went back to 9. But I just really would like us not to go back to Civil War days. Well, <laughs> I mean, arguably, there's an argument that, you know, responding to some of the pressure and having the pressure release valve in doing something like maybe not packing the court, but getting rid of um, judicial review. I made an argument in a radar, I think, weeks and weeks ago that the court claimed for itself the power to review these cases, which, again, is not in the Constitution. So this is that we want to be picking and choosing and playing games with the Constitution. It could be that you severely limit the power of the court so it can't hear many of these questions. And that will truly actually leave more things to the states instead of having it in the place where it's often invalidating legislation um, that the states have decided for itself, whether it's you know abortion laws, people are now talking about a national abortion ban, whether it's the the right to die. We saw conservatives really wanting to get uh, in the way of like a, what was it, Oklahoma or Oregon's law that allowed people to do assisted uh, physician assisted su suicide, or any other of these kinds of things. So we'll yeah. see what they come up with. It I looks mean, like not much from the Dems. At the end of the day, legislators need to get off their rear ends and legislate. They need to stop just doing these dog and pony shows that they do. Everything is just for clicks and videos. And, you know, they're not actually doing anything. And they need no. to go and actually do something rather than kicking everything to the court and saying the court decides. They've been doing that for years, whether it be from gay marriage to now Roe v. Wade, all these, all these issues. And they just need to start legislating. And they just don't want to. And that well, they yeah. are. Yeah, totally. We need, we need people to act. I'm looking forward to seeing what the audience has to say about this, what kind of, you know, interventions into the Supreme Court they would be, you know, happy with. Uh, I think the, the public is just being introduced to some of these ideas and we'll have a, a lot of time in the future to talk about what the implications of them are more broadly. We will have more rising for you after this.